One of our challenges in this field is trying to help people realize just how much great work is being done in the field. And that's been hard to do until Gil Oman stepped up and said he thought we should have a prize for the best paper uh, in the field of evolution of medicine published in any journal. He and I talked about this in the cafeteria at University of Michigan about three years ago now, and he generously donated $5,000 last that, that year. And then after he saw how well it came out, he decided to do it again. Actually, and I, did, I committed for the two years to start. He committed to the two years to start with. I'm being less generous than he is. Um, it now looks like this will likely be an ongoing enterprise. Uh, we want to give our speakers a little time to actually speak. So I'm simply going to show you the slide here from the committee, chaired by Alan Rodrigo with Carl Bergstrom and Sarah Tishkoff uh, from last year. Out of all the papers that were nominated, 50-some papers, they chose a paper by Endomogenes. Is that the right pronunciation? Yeah, um, called Dual Host Virus Arms Races Shape an Essential Housekeeping Protein. And we are going to give her a symbolic empty envelope because she already got her $5,000. <laughs> and Peter Gluckman has offered to introduce her. Well, I've got little to say, but I think we should just first acknowledge Gil Oman. I think there are many great people. <laughs> For those who don't know Gil, I'm going to take one minute just to say a little bit about him. Because he's had a remarkable career and he's been both extraordinarily generous of his time and his resources to all of academic medicine and indeed to the whole of this country's science endeavour. He's previously been a, direct, a Deputy Director of the Office of Science, Technology and Policy under Professor Jimmy Carter. He's been Dean of the School of Public Health in Washington, University of Washington. He's been the Chief Ex Executive Officer of the University of Mich Michigan Health System, and he continues to be remarkably active in many ways in science in this country, and that he spent all three days here, having been brainwashed, no doubt, by Randy from his time in Michigan, and he's supporting the society in this way is just a remarkable. Thanks, Gil, very much. I'm not going to take any time to introduce Anne because her CV, her history is in the handbook and rather than taking time from her chance to tell us about her exciting science, I think we should just let Anne get on with it. Good afternoon, everyone, and I would really like to thank uh, Dr. Gil Oman and the prize committee for awarding me this really prestigious prize. And um, I just want to say uh, thank you and thanks for inviting me. So um, I'm just going to tell you about my time in the Sawyer Lab and what we um, we are really interested in the Sawyer Lab is studying proteins involved in host virus interactions. And today um, I'm going to tell you about one host cofactor protein transferring receptor which is hijacked for viruses for entry. I'm gonna tell you about the positive selection we found within this host cofactor protein, and then what that has taught us about the evolution of this protein and virus host range. So just a little bit what I mean by virus host range is just the species that a virus is able to infect. So in this case, this imaginary virus can infect bats and rodents, but is unable to infect humans or other primates. But let me give you some real-world examples of virus host range. So we all know about HIV. It has a very restrictive host range, primarily infects only humans. And then there's other viruses that have very broad host ranges, such as flu, which infect humans, and pigs, and horses, and avians. And so we're really interested in some, like, what are the molecular determinants of host range? And of course, our adaptive immunity plays some component in determining host range, but there are actually molecular components that, um, that are within an individual cell that determine um, the viral host range. So let me just talk to you about some of those viral host range determinants on the molecular level. So a very famous example, which I'm sure you guys have all heard about, is um, the TRIM5-alpha restriction factor. 
against HIV. So the trim 5 alpha of rhesus macaque is able to restrict HIV by um, interacting with the capsid protein and therefore preventing infection, whereas the human version of this restriction factor can't. But restriction factors don't have to be the only molecular determinants of host range. Cofactors can as well. And there's a very famous example in which transferrin receptor, which is the um, entry receptor for feline parvovirus, turns out to be the key molecular determinant of host range for that virus. So feline parvovirus circulated in cats, but was restricted from dogs until the late 1970s when the virus gained the ability to infect dogs, and then it spread through you know, the dog population worldwide in just a number of years. And um, work by Colin Parrish at Cornell University really found that drug transferrin receptor actually had these key glycans on its surface that prevented the virus from being able to bind, and that um, when the virus gained a mutation that allowed it to bind in spite of those glycosylations, we saw the species jump and it go into dogs. So the virus receptor interaction, which I've depicted here between this cartoon virus and a cellular receptor, really represents an ideal opportunity for the host to block viral infection if it can accumulate mutations on this surface that prevent the virus from being able to enter. And so we would expect to see evidence of an evolutionary arms race within the host receptor right at that interaction interface. So I'm just gonna give a kind of a cartoon overview of an evolutionary arms race. And so these evolutionary arms play, so play out over long periods of time. So we have a host protein, this is just a cartoon version, and let's say it's a receptor. And it interacts with a viral protein, which in this case, let's say a viral glycoprotein. And so this interaction is successful, and therefore we can see infection. But you can imagine that the host might have a gain a mutation that would have an allele that might change this interaction interface. And if um, that prevented infection, that might give the host a selective advantage and therefore um, might rise in frequency within the population. But of course, viruses are evolving as well, and they might gain a mutation that would reestablish this interaction and therefore reestablish effect infection. And this, um, this treadmill can play out over huge periods of evolutionary time and really is indefinite. And it, in, a, in a form of evolution called recurrent positive selection. And you can really see this drive for protein innovation happening if you look at the um, amino acids encoded for at this um, interaction interface. So here's another cartoon version. So these are just the amino acids at this protein interface. And without the drive for protein innovation without the drive for the virus, we don't really expect to see over evolutionary time much, many changes in the amino acids encoded at that spot. But if we have this virus and we have recurrent positive selection occurring, we see like continuous protein innovation happening right at this interaction interface because of the virus. And so to do sort of evolutionary analysis looking at for positive selection, the first thing we need to do is create an alignment of DNA from divergent species for our gene of interest so that we can actually assess the types of mutations that have occurred over time. So the types of mutations we're looking at are non-synonymous mutations, which um, change the protein sequence, and synonymous mutations. So just like all of you know, these two types of mutations can occur just about randomly. But the retention of these mutations is actually what's selected, um, what's influenced by selection. So in the, um, we just summarized the rate of non-synonymous muta mutations by the, the category DN and the rate of synonymous mutations by DS. And in the example I'm showing you above is a selection against non-synonymous change or purifying selection in which DN is much smaller than DS. And this is what we find in most of the proteins or genes in our body because they all have important housekeeping functions that need to be maintained. So they do not want to be necessarily doing protein innovation. But in the reciprocal scenario, DN far exceeds DS in an evolutionary form of selection called positive selection. And so if you look at the alignment, you can see that there are far more non-synonymous mutations than synonymous mutations. And in fact, if individual codons within um, a gene have 
gone through recurrent rounds of positive selection, and we have a deep enough sequence alignment, we can actually find individual codons, which we did in this case, that are evolving under positive selection. And so when they might be scattered on the linear diagram, but if you were to map them onto a crystal structure, we might see them highlighting this interaction interface that we're um, interested in. And so like I said earlier, if the host can um, select for mutations that in this cellular receptor that prevent from the virus being able to bind, then we would expect to see recurrent positive selection happening right at that interaction interface. And since the sites under selection are the sites that give the host a selective advantage, we expect that actually these sites are the sites that are in, we believe will be very important for determining host range. And so for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to talk about one cellular receptor, transferrin receptor, which is used in the uptake of iron from the blood. As I told you earlier, parvovirus, which circulates in all carnivores, not just cats and dogs, utilizes transferrin receptor for entry. But other viruses do as well. So we know that MMTV, which is in the house mouse, also utilizes transferrin receptor for entry. And then these new world arena viruses that circulate in several Central and South American rodents also use transferrin receptor for entry. These new world arena viruses are zoonotic and can cause hemorrhagic fever when spread to humans. And so um, transferrin receptor seems to be almost like an Achilles heel for the cell, being utilized by multiple viruses from various virus families for entry. And today my talk is going to focus on the evolutionary analysis, analysis I did of rodent transferrin receptor um, and looking at MMTV and these new world arena viruses. So just a little bit more about new world arena viruses. They are enveloped, single-stranded RNA viruses. Um, they, uh, he pictured here is the Machupo virus, which causes Bolivian hemorrhagic fever. They're biosafety level four pathogens. And they're also considered a biodefense category A bioterrorism agent. And that's primarily because they can be grown relatively easily, they can be lyophilized, and there are very few treatments. And so these also represent an emerging pathogen as we can see zoonotic events when they spread from their um, rodent hosts into humans. One of the few um, new world arena viruses that we actually have a vaccine for is the Hunin virus, which causes Argentine hemorrhagic fever. And so um, this, is, this disease is primarily gotten by farm workers who actually breathe in the urine and feces from this dry lands laucha, which gets aerosolized when they're using these mechanical corn harvesters, and then they contract the disease. And so within the Hunin province, they actually have a treatment center. This is looking down from the balcony where they grow the candid one um, live attenuated vaccine. And then they also store serum from survivors that um, can, so that when people become infected with this disease can be treated. So here are a subset of the New World Arena viruses and where they were found. Um, very interestingly, not all arena viruses um, can cause hemorrhagic fever. There are several that have been identified that don't. And the molecular reasons for this remain unclear, but we know that transferrin receptor is definitely a part of the scenario. Since the two that we know don't cause hemorrhagic fever, those glycoproteins are not able to interact with human transferrin receptor. So we wanted to ask the question, are, is transferrin receptor under positive selection and is this being driven in these rodents by um, these new world arena viruses? So the key to any positive selection analysis is to do your analysis in the reservoir species for the virus family of interest. So what we did is we looked at transferrin receptor sequence from a number of Myriadidae and Chrysotati rodents. So here are the rodents that we used in our study. Here's their phylogenetic relationship, and then here's the viruses that infect them in nature. So it's well char characterized that these South American rodents have been in a long-term coevolution with these New World arena viruses, and in fact, each kind of South American rodent has their own flavor of virus that they have co-evolved with. 
So let me introduce you to the to transferrin receptor. It's a homodimer with each wing of the butterfly-like structure made up of a single monomer. It sits on the cell surface and binds soluble iron-loaded transferrin for uptake into the cell. So in our analysis, we found tra rodent transferrin receptor to be under positive selection, and we found six sites to be highly significant. These six sites kind of lay scattered on the linear diagram, but when you place them on the crystal structure, you can see that they form a beautiful ridge on the outer surface of this receptor. And um, the sites under selection don't align with where transferrin binds, which is more centrally on the molecule, so probably does not affect um, host function. So if we take a closer look at the sites under selection, so here are the two sites, two of the sites under selection, you can see that they are highly variable. Sometimes we found up to six different amino acids being sampled in just eight species analyzed. Whereas if you look at the sites that surround the sites under selection, they're highly conserved. So in 2010, um, the Harrison lab co-crystallized the glycoprotein spike of the new, Machupo New World arena virus bound to human transferrin receptor. And so if we map from that co-crystal where the interaction interface is, um, you can see that three of the sites we found under positive selection fall right into that New World arena virus interaction interface. And then there's another three sites. And how we explain those is Susan Ross's lab um, discovered that transferrin receptor is the cellular receptor for MMTV, and through chimeric analysis, narrowed down the interaction interface to these two small regions within the protein, and we map those regions onto the, the crystal structure. We can see that our last three sites fall right within that interaction interface. So we found rodent transferrin receptor to be under positive selection, and it appears to be driven by two distinct virus families. And the sites under selection highlight both interaction interfaces shown here in gray and in blue. So we wanted to go on and ask, we found these sites, but what do they mean? What do they mean to host range? So what we did is we created MLV pseudotyped viruses that display either the different arena virus glycoproteins or the MMTV OMB on their surface. Then I created stable cell lines that express transferrin receptor transferrin receptor from human, as well as these exotic um, trans, um, rodent transferrin receptors, and then I could also mutate them and ask them, ask questions on viral entry. And we can measure viral entry from a GFP cassette that is delivered by each of those viruses. And so first we wanted to just determine like viral compatibility between the viruses, the viral glycoproteins and transferrin receptor. And so shown here, where we measure entry by mean fluorescent intensity, you can see that um, what was already known for these arena virus glycoproteins is that they're kind of promiscuous. They can utilize um, their host transferrin receptor as well as human and other rodent transferrin receptors, whereas MMTV had a very um, narrow host range kind of thing where it could really only use transferrin receptor from the mouse, which is the host, and not human or other transferrin receptors. So we wanted to... Um, asked, could these mutations that we found actually be adaptive ones that have been selected for in non-hosts to prevent infection? And so we used this same um, MLV pseudotyped assay to ask this question. So I took um, the sites under selection within the MMTV region, and I mutated them from what we found in the host to what we found in the non-host. So only the three sites under selection are being mutated. The transferrin receptor we're using is this host transferrin receptor, the mouse one. And so when we infect with our MLV pseudotyped with the MMTV OMB, we can see that the host can, uh, is readily used, the host transferrin receptor, but mutating only the three sites under selection, we can drastically decrease the ability for MMTV OMB to interact with this host transferrin receptor and therefore infect the cell. And we know this isn't due to transferrin expression levels, as we can monitor that during the experiment with an antibody to a flag tag, which is fused to each of the receptors that we express. So now that we could show that the sites could be adaptive, we really wanted to ask the opposite question, the reciprocal question. Could we actually make a non-host more susceptible by only mutating the sites under selection? 
And so we took um, a non-host transparent receptor and mutated the three sites within the MMTV binding region again to what they are in the host. And lo and behold, we could. We could make a transparent receptor more susceptible by only mutating the sites under selection. And that only affected MMTV entry. It didn't affect arena virus interacting with these transparent receptors as we can, um, this non-host is permissive for all of these um, arenavirus transparent receptors and we don't see any difference in entry there. So we were able to perform both gain of function and loss of function swaps in the cellular receptor and we only used positive selection to identify these critical um, residues that we think are key determinants of host range. And so after our analysis, we were left with a little bit of a mystery. We kind of wondered why we found sites of selection that were so important for MMTV when none of the rodents in our study really get MMTV. MMTV is very, has a res very restrictive um, host range, really only um, infecting rodents of the genus Mus. But if we looked at the sites under selection, we saw that they were highly variable across all of these species. So we kind of wanted to ask the question, did MMTV actually have a much broader host range and that now in modern times has a very narrow host range? And that's why we see these signatures of positive selection. So lucky for us, MMTV is a retrovirus. And as all of you know, one of the signatures of a retrovirus is that it inserts its genome into um, the host genome that it infects, and they become endogenous retroviruses. And in fact, you know, our genome is littered with these endogenous retroviruses. 8% of the human genome are these past retroviral infections that that have in, become part of our genome. And just to give you an example of how significant this is, you know, coding sequence is less than 2% and 8% of us are past infections. And so these retroviruses, endogenous retroviruses really are retroviral fossil records of infections that happened in the past and that we've been able to successfully fight off. So can we find evidence of an MMTV fossil record in the genomes of these rodents. And so just doing a simple blast search uh, using MMTV, we found evidence of an MMTV-like herb in the deer mouse, Permiscus maniculatus, and also in the rat. These were already known, and they are highly um, conserved um, herbs to MMTV, and they're most closely related to MMTV than any other herb or any other virus. And so we might not be surprised, you know, that we found an MMTV-like herb in the brown rat. It's pretty closely related to mouse in, the, in our scheme of the rodents that we um, analyzed. But Paramiscus maniculatus is more closely related to these Chrysotati rodents, actually. So we think that this is um, pretty good evidence that MMTV actually used to have a much broader host range, probably infecting, um, you know, rodents or these rodent ancestors. Um, and then maybe due to these uh, mutations that we've found in transferrin receptor has had its um, host range really narrowed and now it only infects um, rodents of the genus Mus. And so um, just to switch gears and talk about humans a little, interestingly enough, humans actually have a SNP within this arena virus binding region. Um, human SNP L212V, so most of us carry a leucine at 212, but there are small fraction that carry a valine. It's been reported in both Chinese and Japanese populations. And so using our, um, our uh, assay, we could assess whether this allele gave, uh, gives any sort of protective phenotype. And in fact, um, in, our, in our hands, it does. So um, we express the minor allele, the V, and the major allele, the L on our cell lines and then infected with our MLV pseudotyped Machupo virus. And as you can see, we see less viral entry with this minor allele as compared to the major allele. Now, we don't believe that selection is working upon this allele now. We think that it, you know, it just came about because of drift, um, because you know, uh, arena viruses aren't found in um, aren't found in Asian rodents, but you can imagine that selection might act upon this allele if the renoviruses were ever introduced to that part of the world. So I really think, um, you know, looking at recurrent positive selection as a tool to explore host virus interactions 
and the history of infection is really powerful. And I'm just going to tell you really quickly about a couple of other stories we've worked on in the lab to look at this. So like I told you before, transferrin receptor is, um, circulates in carnivores. And we looked at positive selection in a large carnivore clade. Um, and we've found that it is under positive selection. We believe this is due to parvovirus. And we did this in collaboration with Colin Parrish's lab at Cornell University. And what we found in that is that it looks like parvovirus jumping into dogs is actually not a new emergence, but a reemergence. And we can kind of tell that from the uh, looking at selection in this protein. Another um, study that we worked on was um, looking at positive selection in bat ACE2. So ACE2 is the cellular receptor for SARS. And when SARS happened, it was kind of a question of what the viral reservoir for SARS was. We suspected it was bats, but they had never found any virus that utilizes ACE2 in bats. And so what we did is we did positive selection analysis on bat ACE2, and just like with transferrin receptor, we found sites under selection, and they perfectly aligned with where the SARS um, receptor binding domain was. And actually, sites we found under selection were um, actually the interaction sites between these two proteins. And so, very, so we proposed that, in fact, bats were the reservoir and that those the viruses that are in bats utilize ACE2 for entry. And then very satisfying for us, a year after we published, they found the very first ACE2 utilizing SARS-like virus in a bat. So, And then we also work on, um, on primates and looking at primate sel um, positive selection. So Sarah has this uh, very amazing resource in her lab as she has bioresources. Um, bioresource from about 100 um, primates, and then we also have 20 immortalized, uh, primary immortalized cell lines from a number of um, primate uh, species. So we're able to really look and explore um, primate positive selection. So with that, I looked at positive selection in the Duffy receptor, found it under positive selection, um, and this is the cellular receptor for malaria. And then we've also looked at other proteins, not just receptors. I looked at VAMP1, which is a snare protein cleaved by botulism neurotoxin, and we found that it's highly variable um, and that it probably um, gives some protection against cleavage. And then we also found 11 DNA repair genes, including BRCA1, to be under positive selection in primates. And um, you know, to this day, I don't think we have a really good explanation as to why uh, DNA repair genes are under positive selection here. Okay, and then in my last couple minutes, I just want to tell you about what I do now. So I'm no longer an academic. I've moved into industry, and I work for um, this company called Biofire Diagnostics, and we make this really amazing product called the Film Array. And uh, so it's essentially like a, a fancy PCR machine. We sell it to um, hospitals, and it does syndromatic diagnosis of infectious disease in one hour. So we can go from... Um, two minutes of hands-on time, so this is like the specimen that you get in the lab, a nasal pharyngeal swab. It gets loaded onto this machine. We design panels for it, and then in one hour, you'll know what the, what the causative agent was. So here's just an example of one of our panels. We make a respiratory panel. So it simultaneously diagnoses 17 viruses and three bacteria, and where my, I would say, like, where I get to use my evolution research and like skills is really, you know, like designing these assays. So we have to be highly, highly inclusive. So that means that we have to get everything that we possibly can because it would be detrimental to a patient to have a false negative. But we have to be highly exclusive. So we have to make sure we're not accidentally going to get anything that's closely related to these but doesn't cause the disease. And so we make a respiratory panel, a blood culture panel, a gastrointestinal panel. We're working on our meningitis panel, about to turn it into the FDA. Just That's what I get to go back and do. And then a lower respiratory panel. And I think this is a really exciting time for molecular, um, for molecular diagnostics because this is really going to reach out and touch like these patients on a daily basis or 
we're trying to get this not just from the hospitals, but also into you know, the doctor's offices. And you know, this has a real impact with a one hour turnaround time being able to really change patient outcomes. And actually, it has really important um, you know, uh, significant, uh, significance in antibiotic stewardship, so making sure people are really getting the right targeted therapy. So with that, I'd like to thank my former advisor, Dr. Sarah Sawyer, who is currently moving to the University of Colorado at Boulder. I'd like to thank the American Cancer Society, who gave me my funding during my postdoc. And I'd also like to again thank Dr. Gilbert Oman and the Oman Prize Committee and everyone here for listening to my talk. Thank you. What do you think drives the positive selection in the host? In the host? Mm. I believe it's that, well, okay, so we don't, we don't know the effects of being a carrier, right, of reservoir. I mean, nobody has really done extensive studies on whether being infected with one of these new world arena viruses get, causes fitness within the host. So maybe there is a fitness cost, and that's what's been driving the positive selection. I think there are some indications of MMTV having a fitness cost in mice, like with breast cancer or something like that. But um, yeah, so but maybe something like that is driving that. Um, so you mentioned that transparent receptor might be an Achilles heel for mammalian sales, cells. Uh, are there any um, Achilles heels like uh, epitopes that uh, are on all pathogens or the ones that you're targeting that could be really um, effective and not uh, under selective pressure for your panels? You mean on the virus side? Yeah, okay, so we looked at the, we did a small study of the, the viral glycoprotein to see if it was under positive selection and we did find some sites on the virus side. But viruses are, you know, they're very diverse, and uh, you know the the diversity of them kind of doesn't allow for the the kind of analysis that we do. Especially since the type of analysis we do, you have to really have a very um, solid tree. You have to have a very solid understanding of the relationship between the species, and it's a lot harder to do that on the virus side. So. So, and quite often we are misled by the names that are put on proteins and genes. Given what you now know, what might be a better description of this molecule that's called transferrin receptor? Oh, I don't know. It's definitely, uh, I don't know. It's such a beautiful butterfly. That's one part I love about it. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's made me wonder a lot. Like a lot of people ask me why those top lobes even exist, right? If they're, it's actually where parvovirus binds as well. Why do they, why are they even there? And so, um, you know, I'm sure evolution could tell us that if we could ask the right question, but. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very, very much, Thank you.